Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, working to improve cybersecurity and provide policy guidance through partnerships with industry, government, and academia. Smithville Fiber, the Gigacity Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. It's up for debate. Are fantasy sports a form of illegal gambling? I did it when I needed to win money quick. State legislators will take up the issue when they reconvene in January. Ahead, how their decision could impact your fantasy football league. St. Mary of the Woods College in Terre Haute is one of the latest schools to go co-ed. I fell in love with the campus. I thought the faculty was really strong and the, the program was great. Coming up, what's behind the decision and how is the college able to enroll men and stay true to its mission to empower women? Plus, this week we celebrated Veterans Day. The USS Indianapolis sunk 70 years ago. Next, we talked to one of the ship's surviving crew members who says he fought like hell to stay alive. Everybody asked me, would you jump off the ship? I didn't jump off the ship, it left me. Plus, the latest news headlines from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. Well, if you've watched any sports lately or listened to music online, you've likely heard for, of ads for DraftKings and FanDuel. There's a debate raging over whether the daily fantasy sports sites are legal. This week, New York's Attorney General banned the daily fantasy sites from accepting bets in the state because he argues the activity is illegal gambling. As Barbara Brozier reports, Hoosier legislators are pondering the same question and planning legislation to address the issue. When Indiana University student Ben Siegelbaum isn't in class, you'll find him here, in his dorm room, engulfed in all things sports. Sports is everything for me. I mean, maybe too much everything. So when he saw an ad on TV for the website DraftKings, he immediately signed up. I did it when I needed to win money quick. The websites allow people to log on and create fantasy teams for everything from NFL games to MMA fights. If you have a million dollars, you can put it one dollar in a million contest. Siegelbaum decided to start small, spending only $25. I told myself that my parents would kill me if I put in any more than $25. Because I can't imagine that visa bill saying DraftKings on it and getting a call from my mom and dad saying, what are you doing? Just about as quickly as he put his money into a game, it was gone. I put my money in and it went away because there's five million people. And that adds up quickly. The sites collect hundreds of millions of dollars from fans, which is catching the attention of lawmakers in several states. Arizona, Iowa, Louisiana, Montana, Nevada, and Washington have outlawed the websites. They argue it's gambling, but DraftKings and FanDuel advertise their fantasy offerings as games of skill. I do feel that it is gaming. You know, we're taking, somebody takes money and uh, they, they certainly, they build a team and they put that money down on, on a, uh, in a contest and they either walk away with more money or they walk away with no money. And, and uh, I guess if it looks like a duck and walks like a duck, it's probably a duck. According to the Indiana Gaming Commission, gaming facilities in the state have paid more than $150 million in taxes so far this year. While daily fantasy sites are happy to take Hoosier's money, they're not paying anything. Now, by no means do I think that their tax structure should look the same as the existing, because it's a different game and, and there's different, uh, 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 different amounts of money that ultimately the house gets to keep. But something has to be left behind uh, for the state of Indiana. There are also concerns about who's behind the keyboard on these sites. When you sign up for DraftKings, all you have to do is check a box saying you're 18 years old. You don't even have to put in a birth date. And then when you sign up on FanDuel, all you see is this small disclaimer at the bottom of the page that says joining confirms that you're 18 years old. You know, I've heard stories and there's been a lot of stories of kids uh, underage, you know, as young as 12, signing up and playing. 
and you know we need to make sure that that doesn't happen. Legislators plan to work with the state's gaming commission before drafting any legislation that would regulate the daily fantasy sites. A bill proposed last year that would have allowed Racinos to conduct fantasy sports leagues didn't make it very far. I think now we're, we're kind of past that where we're looking more towards how do we you know, rein in and get some control over the current companies that are out there. And that could be through agreements with other casinos that have a license here in Indiana, but it could also uh, be that we work something out where they don't have to go through the casinos. As legislators consider how to move forward, Siegelbaum says he won't be signing on to DraftKings anytime soon. And he thinks a little regulation wouldn't be a bad thing. You definitely need to watch out for just like 10 year olds who crack into their parents' bank account and spend $1,000 on a game. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Barbara Brozier. The Indiana Attorney General's office hasn't weighed in on the issue. Morrison and Ford are planning on introducing bills in both the House and Senate during the upcoming legislative session. Now for headlines, we go over to Barbara Brozier, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Thanks, Joe. Legislators convene Tuesday for what's shaping up to be a third straight legislative session dogged by issues surrounding gay marriage. Republican leaders have been mum about whether they'll hear a civil rights bill or what form it might take if they do. But the Indiana Chamber has thrown its weight behind a bill, saying it's a necessary action to counteract negative perceptions from this year's quickly amended Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Democrats say they'll introduce legislation to extend civil rights protections to gays and lesbians. House Minority Leader Scott Pilath predicts it'll pass the House if it reaches the floor, but its prospects in the Senate, where Republicans hold a 40-10 majority, could be difficult. And businesses from around the Hoosier state are forming a coalition to push for that anti-discrimination law. The coalition is calling itself Indiana Competes and will comprise businesses large and small. Indiana Competes joins the fight for LGBT rights already being waged by two other groups, Freedom Indiana and Tech for Equality. One Indiana senator wants to pass a bill regarding I-STEP test scores as early as Tuesday. Senator Mark Stoops has requested the Indiana legislature attempt to pass a bill that would protect teachers and schools from low I-STEP grades. Sen senator Stoops sees this as an opportunity to support schools, teachers, and students. One issue that will almost certainly dominate a lot of time during the session is infrastructure. Hoosier lawmakers say Indiana needs to spend more money on infrastructure, but they can't agree on how to pay for improvements to roads and bridges. House Democrats unveiled a plan this week that would funnel money to state and local agencies. Governor Mike Pence unveiled a four-year, $1 billion plan last month that would pay for improvements to INDOT maintained roads. Pence wants to fund the proposal using a combination of reserves, bonds, and future state budgets. Democrats say their proposal goes a step further because it includes money for local roads. Approximately 53% of it will go to state roads and bridges. 47% of it will go to counties in cities that are in dire need of this funding. The plan would divert sales tax revenues on gasoline and special fuels to road maintenance. Democrats say that would have generated $525 million this year. We need to begin the era where everything you pay at the pump that goes to the state of Indiana goes back to paying to fix, maintain, or create a road or a bridge here in this state. While the plan wouldn't require the use of bonds, it would require the state to shift more than half a billion dollars out of its reserves in the first year. Pence says he welcomes House Democrats to the road funding conversation, but believes their $2 billion infrastructure proposal could bankrupt the state. But Pence still doesn't have an answer for how local communities fit into his own plan. A federal report released this week says the state could be putting Hoosier workers at risk. The Occupational Health and Safety Administration says Indiana doesn't have enough compliance officers to inspect workplaces for safety hazards. According to the report, the agency only competed 56% of its inspection goal in 2014. The report also says it took the state 
an average of 72 days to investigate complaints and that it's not responding to imminent danger complaints fast enough. Federal prosecutors are seeking the maximum sentence in the case against former subway spokesman Jared Fogel. In August, Fogel pleaded guilty to child pornography charges and paying for sex with minors. The maximum sentence would mean 12 and a half years in prison and a lifetime of parole. Fogel is scheduled to be sentenced on Thursday, and he's asking for the minimum sentence of only five years. The group suing the city of Terre Haute over a sludge drying contract is adding more people to the lawsuit. Highland TH, an overseas lease group, included Terre Haute Dewatering Company in Plonker Construction to the lawsuit, claiming Terre Haute agreed to pay 240 monthly payments of more than $700,000 for sludge drying purposes. Terre Haute Mayor Duke Bennett says nothing has changed from their end of things, but the city refiled this week to dismiss the claims again. You know, really, in my opinion, those things should have been direct lawsuits with them if they felt like they had a claim, not <laughs> throwing it on top of this. But so we had to respond to all that. Bennett says the contract needed to go to the city council to be valid, but the lawsuit is still breaching the contract and is looking to recoup those promised payments. A decision isn't expected until January. Indiana nearly fails when it comes to state integrity. That's according to a new report from the Center for Public Integrity. It graded the state on several categories, including issues such as public access to information. Luke Britt is the state's public access counselor, and he says that changes in how people communicate could be affecting government transparency. I continually stress to public officials to be mindful that whatever you put down on paper or put in an email, even if it's in digital form, is public record and it's potentially subject to disclosure. Indiana's grade this year is down from the 2012 report, which gave the state a C-. Business leaders and academics met in Noblesville earlier this week for a symposium on hemp, part of an ongoing effort to legitimize and kickstart the crop in Indiana. As Becca Costello reports, despite legislators legalizing the growing of hemp last year, it hasn't taken off. Companies set up booths showing off hemp-based items like lotion, clothing, pet products, and even a concrete-like structural support. The Indiana Hemp Industries Association hosted four speakers who talked about the many obstacles preventing hemp from going mainstream in the state. Among them is a complex set of regulations and permissions farmers have to get through to grow the plant. And education is another issue. Many people still equate hemp with marijuana. It's the same uh, plant, uh, the cannabis sativa, but it's like the difference between a, a German shepherd and a poodle. Uh, very different animals, so in this case, very different plants. Purdue plant pathology and botany professor Kevin Gibson presented research from the school on how the plant fares in Indiana soil. He says while summer flooding ruined many test crops, those that survived gave a promising yield. There's certainly interest in it and uh, from a scientific perspective and from an agricultural perspective, it, it looks like there's potential uh, for it, for it in, the, in the state. Blankenbaker says the public perception problem often rears its head in the political arena, where he says politicians have been supportive in private, but too worried to publicly champion the cause due to its connection with marijuana. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Becca Costello. Well, we have some good and some bad news for farmers. Soybean crops are producing higher yields than expected this year. Crops were damaged over the summer by heavy rainfall, but managed to bounce back. The United States Department of Agriculture forecasts a record number of bushels. However, economists say the high supply of soybeans, both in Indiana and worldwide, could result in the lowest soybean prices in the past 10 years. Indiana Supreme Court Justice Brent Dixon will retire early next year after three decades on the bench. Dixon will leave the state Supreme Court next spring as the second longest serving justice in Indiana history. He faced mandatory retirement in July of next year due to his age. Governor Mike Pence is posthumously awarding Indianapolis radio broadcaster Amos Brown the 2015 SACM Award. The award is Indiana's highest honor, and it is going to Brown for his many years spent as a broadcaster. He hosted a daily show on AM 1310, where he worked for nearly 40 years. Brown died unexpectedly last week. His family will hold a private funeral tomorrow. 
IU head coach Kevin Wilson says they're up for a challenge with 15th ranked Michigan coming into town tomorrow. He says they're going to have to find all three phases of the game to come away with their first Big Ten win. You get one dimensional against a great football team, it's going to be tough. You know, and the other last week our run game was decent against a good Iowa run defense, but our pass game wasn't quite up to snuff. So, you know, when we've been our best, we've had you know, all phases contributing, and that means offense, the balance of run and pass. And I think that's where some of those complementary groups, that tight end group is key to what's going on. It's the last home game of the season, so the Hoosiers will honor their seniors tomorrow, and Joe, kickoff is at 3.30. Should be a nice day. Thanks, Barbara. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. How are students, both male and female, adapting to St. Mary of the Woods College going co-ed? We visit campus to learn how it's working and what accommodations school leaders plan to make to attract more men to campus. It was easier to die than to stay alive. That's how one USS Indianapolis survivor describes the days after his ship sank and he and his crewmen were stranded in the Pacific Ocean fighting dehydration, saltwater poisoning and shark attacks. More of his story and how veterans were honored this week across the state. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. We are a nation of explorers. We seek new ways of living, of thinking, and of expressing ourselves. We take risks, we learn from experience, and we keep moving forward. That's why we encourage and celebrate the explorer in all of us. Ten thousand. Fifteen? Fifteen, do you think? Twenty. Twenty-one thousand? Six hundred. Twenty. Eighteen five. Twenty-four. It's at least forty. Look, yeah, look at 4, it. Forty-five hundred thousand. Six fifty. Twenty. Six fifty. This textile would be worth about a half a million dollars. Half a million? No. I knew it. It's just a blanket. Laying on the back of a chair. Well, sir, you have a national treasure. Wow. A national treasure. Congratulations. I can't believe this. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. For 175 years, the mission of St. Mary of the Woods College has been to empower women. This year, though, the school went co-ed. Lindsay Wright joins us to explain how the change has affected the school. Joe, St. Mary's decision to go co-ed might seem to run counter to the school's mission, but the school's president says, in fact, just the opposite is true. On any college campus, this scene would be pretty typical. Nathan Mensa is one of just three male students on the St. Mary of the Woods campus. The school was established as an all-girls school in 1840 and stayed that way until this year. Mensa feels at home here. Um, everyone's always so friendly and welcoming. The transition was easy for Mensa. He already attended a few classes here while working toward a degree at Indiana State University at the same time. And I had the option to get the certification and the degree. I was like, well, I'll just, you know, make my life a little bit easier. Uh, stop bouncing between two schools. Male students have been able to take courses for certificate programs as well as graduate programs starting in 1985. So according to President Dottie King, it's not that big of a change. Remember, we've had men in classes, so we still have men in classes. The Board of Trustees made the decision to go fully co-ed in May, but it was part of a discussion that's been happening for years as the school watched enrollment decline. The board looked at this for a full year in context of, of, of a wider question of uh, future viability and strength and just increasing enrollment at the college and came to the decision that the next step in our mission was to be fully co-educational in all of our programs. The small private school is dependent on tuition dollars and therefore enrollment to operate. Enrollment at the school peaked in 1965, but the numbers have been at the lowest over the past few years. That's similar to national trends. Taken together, the country's all-female colleges have seen a 3% enrollment decline over the last decade. Our historic mission to empower women through this education was being hindered by the fact that most women wouldn't consider single-gender education. 
Since the 1950s, when the courts decided in several cases that single-sex universities violated the Equal Protection Clause of the U.S. Constitution, many women's colleges have decided to accept males. There are only around 50 exclusively female colleges left. That's down from 230 50 years ago. First time I came here, I just kind of had that avenue moment, like, it just, it caught me like, this is where I'm supposed to go. But Sydney Wilderman's decision to enroll at St. Mary's three years ago wasn't influenced one way or the other by the absence of male students on campus. The main reason that I did come here was just like the spirit of the place, um, just the atmosphere. It's really, really cool. Some other schools across the country that have gone co-ed experienced a public outcry from students and alums, and ultimately a few schools reversed their decisions. President King was prepared for some disapproval, so not long after the trustees announced their decision, she began work to form a committee of students, faculty, and staff to work out those concerns. For the just vast majority of them, once we had a dialogue and they understood the, the decision and the reason behind it, and honestly some of the assurances that um, things weren't going to change and the beloved traditions of the college weren't going to just go away, then uh, they have embraced it. Still, the school has been keeping an extra close eye on its three new male students to make sure their transition to campus is smooth and they feel welcome. There was the initial, um, you know, uh, outcry for when the announcement happened. Uh, some people were very not happy about how the decision came to be. Um, and, you know, I always say, you know, that's that's perfectly fine. I don't think that we should ever expect people to all have the agree on the same things. I mean, how many of us are friends with people with different religious views or different political views? Um, so we're all allowed to have different opinions on it. The school is hoping to continue to grow its male student population. If all goes as King plans, that will drive more females to enroll as well. St. Mary of the Woods is now working on a plan to accommodate male students as residents on campus next school year. Joe? All right, thank you very much, Lindsay. This year marks the 70th anniversary of the sinking of the USS Indianapolis, the single greatest loss of life at sea for the Navy. As Harrison Wagner reports, the Greentown Public Library played host to a survivor of the wreck this week. Richard Thielen was only 18 years old when a Japanese submarine torpedoed the USS Indianapolis. Everybody asked me, would you jump off the ship? I didn't jump off the ship, it left me. I just swam away. <laughs> Seventy years later, Thielen is still talking about it, keeping alive the memory of those who perished and passing along the story for future generations. On Monday, Thielen gave a presentation at the Greentown High School Performing Arts Center to an audience that included fellow veterans, Boy Scouts, and family members of those who died in the wreck of the USS Indianapolis. Commissioned in 1932, the Indianapolis had a long and decorated career, including taking President Franklin Roosevelt to South America. In July 1945, the ship delivered part of the Little Boy atomic bomb to the island of Tinian as part of a secret mission. They were then ordered to Guam and later Okinawa. Just after midnight on July 30, 1945, the ship was struck by two torpedoes. Twelve minutes later, the 610-foot-long Indianapolis was submerged. 900 of the 1,196 crewmen aboard the Indianapolis were left bobbing in the Pacific Ocean. Only 317 of them survived. Thielen says he fought like hell to stay alive. It'd be just, it'd just as easy to die out there it is to stay, to stay alive. You had to fight to stay alive. Uh, I see men take off their life jacket, go down to the road deck, get a drink of water. And if you drink a gulp of salt water on an empty stomach, and, and it'll kill you. Your phone comes to your mouth, your eyeballs pop out, and 20 minutes, or about two hours, you're dead. You go, you go, you go surely insane. And I've seen quite a few guys do that. The 900 initial survivors of the attack were subjected to dehydration, saltwater poisoning, and exposure. Thielen had to be resourceful to beat the extreme power of the sun. All I had my shorts. So at daytime, I just put them on my head to protect me from the sun. Nighttime, I put them back on so I wouldn't lose them. So, so other guys, I've seen other men do that, so I thought, good idea, and I did it myself. Sharks posed even more danger to the stranded seamen. The wreck attracted sharks from miles around, allowing them to attack the helpless sailors. In the film Jaws, the character Captain Quint relays his experience of the shark attacks. When he comes at you, he doesn't seem to be living until he bites you. 
And those black eyes roll over white and then... Ah, oh, then you hear that terrible high-pitched screaming. The ocean turns red and in spite of all the pounding and the hollering, they all come in and they rip you to pieces. <laughs> Thielen now lives in Lansing, Michigan, and gets together with other survivors of the wreck every year. Less than 30 of them are still alive, but their memories live on through a memorial in Indianapolis, inscribed with the names of all those aboard. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Harrison Wagner. Thielen's appearance was one of many events held this past week in honor of Veterans Day. At American Legion Post 18 in Bloomington, Honor Guard members started a ceremony with a brief history of the Legion and a 21-gun salute. One service member says he appreciates the event because it allows for a camaraderie and fellowship on the holiday. And that's the end of this program. Our work continues online at WTIU.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, working to improve cybersecurity and provide policy guidance through partnerships with industry, government, and academia. Smithville Fiber, the Gigacity Company, fiber internet, HD, and digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. And by WTIU members, thank you.